Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful humanity to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in human flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind controlled by the sinful nature is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Ma Martin mentioned um, that that reading is the one that's uh, set in the pattern of readings which uh, many Church of England churches follow. And <laughs> just in case you think I'm being a bit old-fashioned, I'm going to tell you my stag story. Have I told you my stag story? <laughs> well, um, Martin knows that five years ago I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, we had a holiday booked and I said to the surgeon, can I go on my holiday first or is it urgent and I've got to have the operation now? And he said, no, go off on your holiday. So we went off on our holiday to the Isle of Mull. And it's a fantastic cottage looking over the sea. And the very first night we were there, about 3 o'clock in the morning, it was just getting light because it was midsummer. About 3 o'clock in the morning, the dog starts to bark. And uh, wouldn't stop barking. So in the end, I got out of bed uh, to see what she was barking at. And um, standing as close to me as Martin, looking in through the big picture window, was a stag. And... Um, that was, that was just a wonderful blessing of God. But it's not the end of the story because um, I went off and I went home. I had my operation. I had all the convalescence that I needed and so on. And I went back to work my first Sunday back. And um, as I always do, I looked in my lectionary, the pattern of readings that I was supposed to preach on that Sunday. And I saw that the reading set for that day was the Song of Songs, chapter 2. My love is like a young stag looking in at your window. <laughs> Just so you know, God, God can work through these things. It's lovely to be here, by the way, uh, once again with my old friend Martin. If you don't know, Martin and I have been really good friends for 44 years, so <laughs> we've got to know each other quite well over those years. But um, <clears throat> I just want to put a um, a slight balance to this too, because I believe God can work through the structures and through the patterns and so on, and I've just shown you how that can be. But also, he can work in other ways. And Martin's just given me to read uh, a book called The Jazz of Preaching. <coughs> and uh, I've read about half of it um, overnight. <laughs> and um, <coughs> if you were at the men's breakfast, you'll know that uh, one of the great things in my life has been the discovery of jazz and how it's led me to fall in love with music all over again. And one of my favorite jazz CDs is by a little band of youngsters. One of them is a friend of my son uh, called Six Pack. And they're, they're brilliant, but they're disbanded, so you won't hear them now. 
unless you hear the CD. Um, one of the tunes they do is a, is a mournful ballad uh, played on the sax. And I felt really, really drawn to this tune. And um, I started to learn to play it. And, um, and then I decided, well, I don't even know what this tune's called, so I'd better have a look. So I looked it up on the CD cover, then I found that it was called a rather enigmatic title, Gather the Spirit. So I learned to play it, and I made an arrangement of it. And then I thought, I'd better find out um, a bit more about this tune. So I Googled it, and I found it's actually him. <laughs> and um, the words are these. Gather the spirit, harvest the power. Our separate fires will kindle one flame. Witness the mystery of this hour. Our trials by this light appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. And it's all about the disparate body of Christ drawn together to be one body. Now, um, that was remarkable because this morning when we were praying in preparation for this service, our friend Chipran here had a little image. Do you want to just tell us something, Chipran? you like me to say, okay. Well, Chipran had this picture of a, of a glass bowl or jug or, or something, um, and it had fallen on the floor and shattered in pieces. And um, what he felt God was saying to us was that actually until these pieces are reunited as one, then God can't use us. And Martin... Um, Wow, it's wonderful. <laughs> What's going on down there? <laughs> Our message here. Great. Okay. So, um, and Martin had the vision that he's read to us from uh, 2 Corinthians um, about um, this bowl. Perhaps it's not finest crystal, but maybe it's earthenware because um, in the ordinary things of life, actually God uses us and uses us as one. And so I'm going to do something actually that I've never done before in my whole life, and that is actually in my sermon, to play the saxophone. <laughs> I'm going to play Gather the Spirit with Margareta. <laughs> there we go. We'll compete with them downstairs, you'll see. <laughs> Those of you at the men's breakfast know that the saxophone's the love of my life. <laughs> My wife gave it to me for my last birthday. <laughs> okay. Is it switched on?
There's a whole lot more from this morning that may or may not <laughs> yet come out because I took the book seriously. Anyway, um, Romans 8, what a wonderful gift to be able to preach from Romans 8, Life in the Spirit. It is in some senses the high point of the New Testament. Through this letter to the Romans, and in particular through this chapter, Martin Luther, John Wesley, and countless others have seen the light and found salvation in Jesus Christ. John Wesley's heart, through this chapter, was strangely warmed, and countless others have been brought to repentance and salvation. If Romans 8 is, as one Bible translation has it, the gospel according to St. Paul, then this is its crowning moment. But I want us to get it in the context in which it's set. Because as usually happens in the Bible, Romans 8 follows chapter 7. And um, the last part of chapter 7, if you're familiar with it, is a very, very bleak passage indeed. In it, Paul describes his struggles against his own nature, his futile attempts at righteousness in his own strength, and the sense of being utterly crushed. And just at the end of that chapter, he cries out, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? There's something authentic about that because Paul is talking about his own experience. This is autobiographical. Paul is describing that journey to Damascus. Paul is describing his life as a Pharisee, absolutely unyielding in his obedience to the law and yet finding that the law couldn't make him righteous. In a sense... This concludes the argument that begins in chapter 1 of Romans, that we all fall short of the requirements of God. Now, it's not that Paul was a bad guy, not by our human standards anyway. He writes this in Philippians chapter 3. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, now get this, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And then he goes on, yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The echoes there of what he wrote to the Corinthians, aren't there? You know, it's not, it's not him. He's just a clay jar. It's God in him. Paul found out about righteousness in Christ the hard way. Harder than, I guess, any of us. You know, he spent his whole life denying himself, fasting, tithing, more than tithing, praying several times a day, walking around in all that clobber that Orthodox Jews wear, keeping a kosher kitchen, all the rest of it. And it didn't do any good because he knew the rottenness in his own heart. And he claims almost as a good persecution of the church. Now all this begins, according to Acts, with the stoning of Stephen. Remember? Stephen and uh, how Stephen died this holy death. How as Stephen died, he had a vision of God standing to receive him into heaven. Do you remember that? Do you remember also how at his trial, Luke writes in Acts, he writes, and they looked at Stephen, and he appeared as if he had the face of an angel. 
Now, there's only one place Luke could have got that from, and that's from Paul himself. So Paul's thinking, look, look at me. I've denied myself all my life. I've obeyed all these stupid rules and regulations. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've tithed. I've done everything that I should have done. And all I know is turmoil. And this heretic here who hasn't done any of this stuff, he knows perfect peace and communion with God. And his response, it's a very typical human response, this. His response to all of that was to run out and try and destroy it all. And you know the feeling, you know, if I can't have what you're having, then you can't have it either. Yeah, very human, isn't it? So off he goes. More and more persecuting the church, killing, rounding up, persecuting, humiliating, and so on, until eventually, of course, the inevitable, he had that great breakdown, that colossal collapse, and eventual surrender just outside the city of Damascus. And then, of course, we move on from chapter 7 to chapter 8. It's the great transition in the Bible. And those absolutely (laughs) extraordinary, stunning words. There is therefore now No condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You know, until we've arrived at that point, we're struggling in the dark, just like Paul, Saul as he was called then. Until we've had that penny drop moment given by God, there is no condemnation for those in Jesus. We will be struggling just like Paul. That's the point that Luther came to. Luther, who was living by a pre-Reformation type of law, discovered that he could be free in Christ. Wesley, who, who lived such a strict life, that the people who made fun of him nicknamed them Methodists because they tried to do Christianity by method, by law. That's how they got to be called Methodists. It was an insult, actually. And Wesley discovered that the method couldn't save him, but that Jesus could. And now I'm getting to the point eventually because... Paul then goes on for the rest of chapter 8 to spell out what it means to live in the freedom of the Spirit. And I think there are just two words. If this is all you go home with today, go home with these. Life in the Spirit means life in all its fullness. And that life entails Perfect freedom. If you don't remember nothing else, remember this. Life in Christ is about the abundance of life and about perfect freedom. But the trouble is that many of us in our churches have done what the Galatian Christians did. And if you know Galatians, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We get the freedom, and then we find it's much too scary for us. And so we go back to some kind of law, some kind of method. And um, it's, it's very easy to see that happening in the church down the road, isn't it? Very easy to see that. I don't know the church down the road, but I'm sure there must be one somewhere. And um, it reminds me, it's probably before some of you are born, but in, in 1986, um, John Wimber came over. Do you remember John Wimber? Uh, and to a big jamboree in, in Birmingham called Acts 86. Do you remember? And, the, and then they decided they'd look up, oh, Acts 86. I wonder if we look up Acts 6, what it says. And it talked about Philip doing signs and wonders, which, of course, was the flavor of the moment at the time and John Wimber was famous for. So they had this big jamboree went on for several days in Birmingham. One of the things I remember about it was that we had a little drama during the course of this. And um, 
uh, the drama told a story. And a man comes on, and he's what, what Martin and I would know, and some of you would know, is a typical eight o'clocker. People who like to creep into Book of Common Prayer, Holy Communion at eight o'clock and scuttle off again at the end, right? And um, he comes in, and he kneels down terribly pie, crosses himself, and attends to his prayers, okay? And then um, a much more liberated Christian comes in wearing jeans and, and letting it all hang out a bit and praising the Lord and so on. And it's quite clear the way this story is going. That, you know, with Wimber here and the signs and wonders, this is the future. You know, it's quite clear this is the way it's going, okay? And then there's this complete twist in the story. And you'll recognize the story because the hit one with the jeans goes, hey, Lord, hey, look at me, hey, great, isn't it? Yeah, praise the Lord. And then the lights go down to the little man on his neat prayer, prayer desk with his hands together. And he just simply says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs> it was one of the most powerful things I've experienced, actually. You'll recognize the story. It's in the Bible. Jesus told it. <clears throat> and I think, I think what I want to say about that is it's very easy to see how others are in bondage to law and slavery. It's actually much harder to see where we ourselves are trapped in something which is not real freedom. Okay? And the trouble with it all is that real freedom is really scary. Um, one, of, one of the little asides in the jazz of preaching is uh, the observation that the word sacred is almost identical to the word scared. Yeah? And, you know, that's it, isn't it? Christ gives us perfect freedom. That's really scary. Jimmy, do you mind if I just say a little bit about your image as well? Um, or do you want to say it? No, no. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say the whole thing because I think there's a lot more to be discerned in this as yet. And, and apologize for preempting the discernment process. But uh, Jimmy had a picture of, of, a, of his life as a road and the side turnings and all that stuff. Anyway, at the end of the story, the road comes to an end. And he turns around and he sees Jesus behind him and he's been behind him all the way. Lovely, lovely image, Jimmy. But freedom... True freedom is about being at the place where you arrived. The road has disappeared because the road is the law. The side roads could be a whole lot of other stuff, temptation, all that sort of stuff. I'm, you know, and, and there's a lot more to come out of this picture yet, so don't take this as the, as the final story. But the road has run out, and that's what happens when we actually arrive at that place of perfect freedom. The road has run out. Now the whole world is ours. The whole world is ours. But, you know, that's really scary. Isn't it much safer to just, you know, keep it all in limits, you know, make sure, you know, we sing certain songs, you know, and stuff, and do certain <laughs> things. I, I, when, when I was a curate, I, I, um, I met another curate, and he'd been off to a, um, a communion service, um, and uh, this guy was a very... Um, Anglo-Catholic guy, and he liked all his kit, you know, all the stuff that, that you wear. And he went off to this um, communion service, and the guy who's taken the communion service wasn't wearing one of these pieces of kit. And he said to me, you know, I didn't take communion because you couldn't be sure that he was sound. <laughs> right? Easy to spot it in something of a different tradition. But... I want to throw this back here to you at Bushmead today. What's your equivalent of that? What's your equivalent? That you are so blinkered that you can't see Christ outside the wall. That's a very important message for us. Because if we truly want to live in freedom, God will come to us in all kinds of unexpected ways. You'll remember Elijah on Mount Carmel, you know, 
There's the earthquake, the wind and the fire. All the things that where God should have been, shouldn't he? Really should have been there because, well, he was there last week that way. <laughs> you know, the, the Pentecostal service, it really got going and they were bouncing and swinging from the chandeliers and people were speaking in tongues and all of it. And a man got up to pray and he said, Lord, Lord, this is great. Your spirit's moving among us, Lord. But Lord, this is nothing. You should have been here last week. <laughs> <laughs> you do something twice, it's a tradition. Okay? So... You know, what is it that has become a tradition? Was I in the middle of a story? I'm getting a bit seen. <laughs> I think I was in the middle of a story. But anyway, there we are. Um, if you do something twice, it becomes a story. What is it that you can't see? I always think that God, in my experience, and I think the experience of many others, is like a jester. He likes to tiptoe up behind us when we least expected him, when we were doing something else and tap us on the shoulder and when we look around, he's gone. But we know he's been there. And that hallows the whole moment. It hallows the place, it hallows the moment because God has been there. Freedom. Freedom. And as Paul urges the Galatians, if you, if you want confirmation of this, go home and read Galatians. It won't take you long. It's a very short letter. Read it all. Why are you going back to slavery when you've been set free by Christ? The abundance of life can only be experienced in total freedom. And that is God's gift to us, my brothers and my sisters. God has given us that gift. Praise God. Life is about grabbing hold of it with both hands and daring to live it to the full. That's what pleases God. Because Jesus came, I said this yesterday, forgive me gentlemen. Jesus came to give us life. Look at John's gospel. It begins with life. In him was life and that life was the light of men. It ends with life. I, have, I came that they may have life in my name. And you know, right in the middle, in the very middle of that, is chapter 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it in all its fullness, in abundance, some translations. John's Gospel, that's not an accident. That's about God, through John, trying to tell us that Jesus came that we should have the fullness of life and understand it in complete freedom. But you know, one of the things that um, was upset in the early church and has upset the church ever since is something called Gnosticism. And um, Gnosticism is the opposite of agnosticism. So you'll gather, gather that Gnosticism is about knowing. It's about knowing the secret knowledge by which we can attain Salvation. It's completely in opposition to the gospel. And um, isn't it odd, actually, and I, I want you to get hold of this too, that we Christians are in opposition to the thinking of Gnosticism, the secret arcane knowledge that can, you know, the funny handshake, all that stuff that can get us to God. And if we're in opposition to Gnostics, that must make us agnostics, doesn't it? And so we are. We are agnostics. And if you read on in uh, Romans 8, you'd have heard Paul say that. He said, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We do not know. We have faith. We have faith. And through faith, we have freedom. It's very different to knowing. But you know, this stuff gets right in to the church and seeks to rob us of our freedom. There's more to Gnosticism. Gnosticism maintains that the created world is evil. It's created by some demonic god in opposition to the true god, and the true god is non-material. So this created world is non-material. 
Right through Christian history, Christians have got sucked into this. They thought, how could Jesus, the Son of God, die on a cross? There must have been some mistake. Paul addresses that in Galatians 2. Um, you can read that for yourselves. How could this Jesus... And so um, some Christians have concluded, well, Jesus, he may have looked like he died on the cross, but he couldn't really have done because he was the Son of God. And anyway, this material world we live in, this is all evil. So how could Jesus really come to us as a human being with flesh and blood and temptations? Yes, it says that in Hebrews. He was tempted just like we are and yet without sin. And with all the urges and desires and stuff that you and I uh, experience in life, Jesus came to be one of that because God says, the true God says, that this world is good. This world is good. God saw all that he had made, and indeed it was very good in Genesis chapter 1. And the goodness of creation is affirmed because Jesus came to be part of it. Jesus was real, just like you, with flesh and blood. If you cut him, he bled. If you humiliated him, he was humiliated. If you tormented him, he was in pain. If you tempted him, he was tempted. Just like you, just like me. Jesus is just like that. And uh, Paul talks about that a lot in Romans 8. Um, and just in case you've got the wrong idea, um, just see how many times, I, I know the translation Martin read, it comes out as human nature a lot of the time, but Paul contrasts all, all the way through the flesh and the spirit, the human nature and um, the life in the spirit. And the thing is that many of us have been tempted to think that flesh should be translated literally as to mean our bodies. And so we've actually got the idea that somehow our bodies are bad and that the desires and appetites of our bodies are somehow bad. And that's led to a really unhealthy concentration among Christians uh, about the distortion of what sin really is. Because if you can somehow make out that sin is just about sex, then um, it actually lets you off the hook for all the other stuff. But actually, if you look at Jesus, he talked about a lot of other stuff, much more than he talked about sex. And I mean, going to some churches, you could be forgiven for wondering if any of them ever have sex. Because, <laughs> you know, um, well, that wouldn't be seemly, would it? But actually, what Paul says is that it's the human nature, not the body, which separates us from Christ. It's the human nature that Paul was struggling with. It's the human nature, the sinful nature, from which God has to set us free. And until we're free, we're struggling with it with Paul and saying, a wretched person that I am, who will set me free from this body of sin? But Paul understands then that it's Jesus who can set us free and give us life and give us perfect life in him. We are free, my brothers and sisters. And Paul's ministry in its entirety was devoted to allowing God through him to set people free and that they should have perfect life and that they should stay alive and stay free. Well, you're always going to be tempted by the works of the sinful nature which will whisper in your ear and want to get you back into slavery again. Want to make you be respectable. Oh, it's no good turning up to church if you don't wear your suit. That's why I'm wearing mine, you see, because it's respectable and Martin's wearing his. You know what I mean? Whatever your respectability is, you have to be respectable. Or um, binding us with the rules and regulations which can never be free, fr bring us freedom. The method, uh, loading us with guilt make us imagine that we can do it by ourselves. And there's lots of churches in that boat imagining that we can do it by ourselves and tut-tutting when we fall. Or perhaps, though less likely in the church, by persuading us that anything goes, that freedom means anything goes. Example, greed and selfishness are good, which is the current culture of uh, the world around us. But we who are agnostics are motivated by faith and hope 
and above all by trust and love. Trusting in the love of God, we know perfect freedom. We know abundant life because the Spirit of God is living in us. And how is that possible? Because Jesus became a man like you and like me with all that we experience in this world and bore himself the burden of our sin and our failure so that we can know freedom. You and I cannot do this by ourselves. And those who try end up in misery. But if we will only trust in the love of God in Jesus Christ, then we can know true life and true freedom. So examine yourselves. Examine what it is. It's different to the church down the road. What it is here in Bushmead, which has the ability to enslave you and to take you back and to rob you of that freedom which Jesus won at such a cost for you and for me. Lord, we ask that um, you would open our eyes so that we would see. You would open our ears so that we'd hear and our hearts so that we receive. And that we would grab with both hands the gift that you have given us at such a cost and that you so long for us to have true freedom, true life, so that we may bring true life and true freedom into this beautiful world that you created. In Jesus' name, amen.